an executive, I guess uh, my role was to do as little talking as possible um, during the uh, session because we've got four quite distinguished or very distinguished panel members with a great deal of experience in our topic. Um, the uh, topic of today's webinar is the story of open, open university in Europe and the world. I think what um, I will do is rather than introduce the uh, panel members uh, myself for reading out their bios, which can always be a bit embarrassing for the participants or the panel members, it might be just a little bit more authentic if I let you introduce yourselves. Um, we have Liz, we have Joseph, we have um, Sarah and Antonio, and I think we might just follow the um, videos panel that I've got in order. So Liz, that puts you number one on what I'm seeing. If I could hand over the microphone for you just to briefly introduce yourself, and um, then we will take it from there. Um, and uh, perhaps in introducing yourself, um, you might just want to give a little bit of your background in terms of the role you play currently and your previous experience, particularly if it's relevant to working in an open university. Okay, sorry Mark, who did you say first? Me. Yes, Liz, if you yeah, want to sorry. start us off, just a brief introduction. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Liz Maher. I'm the um, Pro Vice Chancellor for Students at the Open University in the UK, and I'm also President of the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. Um, I'm, um, I've been in my current role for um, approximately two and a half months, um, but I've been at the Open University for around 10 years, and um, before that I worked in a face-to-face in a -face institution. Um, but, I, but I'm really, really passionate about the Open University movement, not least because my first, um, I guess, higher education learning experience after I left school um, was with the Open University when I had a, a small child, um, and it transformed my life. It transformed my child's life as well, and um, I'm really pleased to be able to work in that movement and, and with all the many other Open University um, aficionados across the world, not just in Europe. And I think I'm handing on to Sarah now. Hello to everyone. Hello to everyone. I'm, wow, I hear, I hear an echo. You hear me well without an echo? Okay. Uh, I'm currently the Vice uh, President for Academic Affairs. But I started with the Israeli Open University already in October 1976, when I was a master's degree student at Tel Aviv University and asked by my professor to be the coordinator of the first education course developed at the Open University of Israel. Uh, my field of uh, study is comparative uh, higher education, with a special focus on distance education and distance teaching universities. In 1999, I published this think cover, terrible pink, cover book, which uh, followed and examined the development of five open universities, the UK Open University, Cern University in Germany, UNED in Spain, Atabasca in Canada, and the Israeli Open University, and uh, tried to explain how they developed very differently because of the academic culture that surrounds them. Uh, I uh, spent several sabbaticals in UNUC, University of Maryland, University College in the United States, in Universidad Oviedo de Catalonia, visited many times the UK Open University, the University, Open University in Portugal, in UNED, and others. So I'm quite familiar with Open University. Thanks very much, Sarah. And I think we'll all hand over now to Antonio. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time that you're watching us. Uh, my name is Antonio Teixeira. Uh, I'm currently the head of the Department of uh, Education and Distance of Learning at the University of Portugal, which uh, is equivalent to a, a Dean of Education position. Um, uh, my, um, my role at university is currently that one, uh, although I've joined the university in 1989, so for 30 years now I've been working at university at the Open University of Portugal. 
Um, uh, well, uh, previously I've been also um, pro-rector for distance uh, education innovation or innovation in distance learning um, at, the, at the university. And I had the role at that time of uh, planning and leading uh, the transformation, the transition at the uh, Open University of Portugal from a distance learning paper-based um, model of operation to a fully online one. So it was one of the first, um, after the work and the Open University of the Netherlands, to, fully, to complete uh, its transition to a fully online mode. Um, apart from it, I was also president of Eden some years ago, and uh, uh, I've been uh, working in this field uh, uh, also in terms of research, and of course, I've been um, throughout this period. I've been acquainted with uh, most of the open universities, not just in Europe, but also um, elsewhere. I've been, uh, uh, for instance, a visiting professor at Korean National Open University, also visiting um, visited the Open University of Japan and many others. So um, uh, this is a, a great topic to discuss today. Thank you, Antonio, and that leads you just to... Okay, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> okay, my name is uh, Joseph Duarte. Um, I'm professor nowadays at the Open University of Catalonia in Barcelona. I'm also, I'm also working uh, as a professor in the Educational Sciences uh, Faculty, uh, and also I'm a research uh, member uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the director of the research group called Open Evidence, uh, which is uh, uh, also a startup of our university working on different European projects and also a research group uh, focused on, on evidences, uh, our research evidence methodology. Uh, and, and I'm also working now in this moment in a huge uh, research about the impact of the online universities on the society. This is a research leaded by Professor Manuel Castell, which, which is working also in, in our university. I'm also a vice president of research in, in Eden uh, and also a, a, a editor in chief, a co editor in chief uh, with uh, other uh, uh, three editors of the International Journal of Educational Technology and Higher Education. And, and from the past, I've been working here in this university, Atomic University in Catalonia, almost of the beginning. Uh, I'm working here for 20, uh, 23 years. Uh, I used to be a uh, director of the UNESCO e-learning UNESCO chair. I was a founder director in 2002 of this e-learning e UNESCO chair. And also, uh, um, I've been a, a vice president of um, continuous education and postgraduate studies at my university uh, for seven years during 2006 to 2013. <clears throat> Well, thank you, panel members. As I said in your introduction, we have a, a very distinguished um, group of panel members here for um, what is an event as part of uh, Open Education Week, and I suppose that's why we're talking about open universities. And um, what we're going to do is just have a conversation around um, two or three questions, depending on how much time we have. We have around about 30 participants, um, it seems, that have gathered. So please feel free, uh, participants, to add any additional questions you might have or follow up comments into the chat uh, box, and I'll endeavour to ensure that we bring those back. And likewise, panel members, you may wish to respond to those questions whilst uh, one of the other panel, panel members is talking. Um, probably without any further ado, I just want to introduce the first question. Um, this might seem uh, self-evident, um, but I think it's important for us, given that definitions change and evolve, and universities have certainly evolved over time, to just reflect on what it makes, what, what makes the open university really unique from other universities, particularly as it stands now. So, um, I'm going to follow the same order, but we'll reverse that order when it comes to the second question. So, Liz, you're not having to be the first person um, to have to respond. And similarly, panel members, feel free to raise your hand if you would like to rejoin the conversation. So we have genuine discussion here. 
Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, this is something that I've thought about quite a lot um, lately for a whole variety of reasons. And I think as uh, what makes the Open University UK unique from other universities is, is three things in combination. So the, the three things can exist um, singularly in other institutions, but it's actually how they combine within the Open University that contributes to that uniqueness. One of those is that most of our students are studying part-time. Now, they can study part-time at most institutions in the UK, um, but, but the majority of ours are studying part-time, although we are seeing some people who are flexing their study intensity, so they might do full-time for a little while and then go back to a part-time mode. The second element is they're studying at a distance, um, and so we don't see our students um, very often. Um, other than through um, technology. Uh, and, the, and the third thing is that we are open access. So no prior qualifications required um, for entry. So some other universities in the UK are doing what, what's, now, uh, what's known as making unconditional offers to students. So they're saying, well, you actually don't need to um, demonstrate that you can meet the qualification requirements to come in. But that's still quite rare. And I think we're, we're, we're pretty unique in, in that, but, but additionally unique because of that combination with distance and with being part-time. But I, I, was, I was contemplating whether to add um, digital in there anywhere um, and, and whether online was an important element of this. Um, it's not unimportant, but I don't think it's what makes us as unique necessarily. And in fact, I think some of us are still, some open universities are still using a combination of um, online and printed materials, So, and uh, as do we in some instances. So the, the digital element I don't think is, is, makes us particularly unique, but I think in combination with these other things and the way in which we use technology, there is kind of a, a there is something that sets us apart. So I think that's my view of, of, of how we're unique. Thanks very much, Liz. That's interesting, that last comment in particular around where online fits into this and other panel members may have a, a thought. Um, if we just follow with Sarah and we'll, in this round, kick, stick to the standard um, sequence we had and then we'll change. That in the book I have mentioned before that they published in 1999, I have a special chapter dealing with eight unique features of open universities, but I will mention here only four main ones. Uh, first of all, obviously, democratization of higher education. Uh, open access. Uh, uh, right now, there are around 60 higher uh, distance teaching universities worldwide, but very few adopted an open access policy. UK Open University, also Athabasca, also uh, Israel. And in, then, in this sense, it was a, a revolution of higher education. When the Open University in Britain, I know, was established in 1969, only 8% of the in relevant age cohorts participated in higher education. In Israel, it was a case of 12%. And right now, in the OECD countries, it uh, fluctuates between 50 to 80%. So definitely, the uh, open universities that were established in the 70s, there were some that were established before, but the huge number were established in the 70s, they really added to the democratization of higher education. A second point is the Iron Triangle, which Daniel uh, uh, presented, that they succeeded to find a balance between admitting huge numbers of students uh, at a lower cost and uh, offering high quality material uh, to produce and develop by team, which was a little bit contrary to the academic uh, freedom of some uh, uh, countries in which which is, is really cherished, like in uh, Germany, in Israel, it was also a problem. But we still develop our courses in, in a team, and these high quality materials were used by students not only of open universities but by higher education institutions in their national jurisdictions. Most important in countries where English is not uh, the tongue language, the national language, so it was a huge contribution for high quality. A study materials in their higher education jurisdictions. A third point, harnessing advanced technologies into their learning teaching system. Uh, when they were established, it was a TV and the radio. Now it's the digital technology. It also creates huge problems uh, transforming 
the distance teaching university based on the industrial model, model of printed materials to the digital age. I will talk about it later on. And the fourth uh, a point that I will mention here is uh, the ability to teach huge numbers of students. In Indira Gandhi University, we have more than 4 million students. The Open University in China has 2.5 million students. Uh, uh, John Daniel also coined the term mega university teaching over 100,000 students, but many universities teach already many more than uh, 100,000 students. So it was really a huge contribution. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, Sarah. So four very interesting dimensions to what uh, perhaps makes the Open University unique. Antonio. Uh... Okay, thank you, Mark. Well, actually, uh, m several of the points that I would make have already been made by Liz and Sarah. Uh, if I can, um, in a way, um, reply uh, to the question in, uh, in a broader sense, I would say that what makes the Open University unique are a combination of a mission, of their mission, their vision, their strategy, and their experience. In the sense that, of course, one of the main uh, aspects is, uh, that differentiates open universities is, of course, uh, the inclusion aspect, the social inclusion. It's, uh, it's a specific um, interest and attention to the social inclusion, cultural inclusion, digital inclusion. So. Uh, this uh, social role of the open universities, which have pl uh, are played in specifically by them, not that the others don't play it as well, but th these are institutions that have been designed specifically for this. And another uh, important aspect related to this is the attention to social groups at risk, uh, being, of course, um, uh, people with special educational need, with uh, special educational needs, being um, incarcerated uh, uh, students, whatever, uh, um, uh, migrants, well. Uh, another uh, important aspect as well deals with uh, the commitment to educational innovation, as Sarah has already pointed out. These universities have been designed as innovative institutions um, and still are driven by the need to innovate the educational process. Related to that is, of course, uh, uh, an important factor, which is uh, the, the fact that these institutions although designed differently from, from traditional um, uh, um, uh, universities or higher education institutions, there's, they're specifically designed to be flexible th themselves. So they are much more flexible uh, 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 than other universities and are much more um, prone to transform and uh, to reshape uh, as uh, technology, pedagogy, uh, or uh, other uh, important aspects uh, evolve in terms of the uh, scientific community and, of course, uh, university um, um, education. Another would also imp uh, important aspect deals with internationalization. The, the open universities have been the first uh, um, institutions that actually have committed to internationalize and to achieve a global outreach. And this is something that um, most of the uh, open universities have. A, a great experience of internationalization and multicultural uh, education, which is uh, important and sh uh, should also, in a sense, makes part of this uniqueness of, the, uh, of these institutions. Uh, of course, uh, Sarah has given some figures which are important. Um, I would just say that, for instance, the Open University of Portugal is responsible for over 90% of the total um, the number of uh, degrees and, and a student, um, a student population involved in formal um, education. So this gives you an example also of the, uh, in, the in, in terms of online um, provision. So this uh, refers also to the importance of these institutions as drivers of the field, especially in the in new areas of development, as is uh, it is still uh, digital education and online education. I'll stop here and give the, the floor to Josep. No, I'll stop to um, uh, mentioning once again uh, the aspect, uh, the, the critical aspect of the um, um, research element as well. Open universities have uh, committed throughout the years to research in educational innovation, and this is also an important asset that they have. Well, back to you, Joseph. 
So thanks very much, Antonio. Uh, just to pull out a couple of points that you've built on from our previous panel members, I think that importance that you mentioned of flexibility and internationalization, which was is, is something that is quite different from globalization. Uh, and then your last comment about contributing to the research, being shapers and makers of the research, not just consumers of that research. I'm just making the job harder for you now, Joseph. So I'll have you. Is this my turn? <clears throat> okay. Uh, some of the things, of course, are already said from the other of the panelists. Okay. But I have uh, three points uh, in, in order to, to explain uh, my point of view about the, the, this unique uh, uh, things about open universities, no? in particular with the experience in, in my university. The first, the first point to me, a very important one, is that uh, the online universities have usually a, a clear educational model. Uh, and I think this is very important from the pedagogical point of view and also the uh, educational point of view. And I think it's something, uh, from my point of view, of view also, uh, something very different, for instance, than the face-to-face -face or traditional universities where the professors have the sometimes their own model, particular model, and each faculty have uh, different models. Maybe, uh, I think, in the, in the open university, maybe it's because uh, we have uh, to think about the uses of technology uh, online, etc., that it's very important to define a kind of educational model, sometimes more centered on the students or in the teaching and learning process, etc., but I think it's important to have this uh, educational approach. This is uh, the first point for me. The second one is related to the students, of course, flexibility, etc. that the other of you said before. But for me, is um, it's a kind of universities that we focus on lifelong learning. That means we have uh, adult students, uh, people that probably uh, need to, of course, uh, be more competent in this uh, society and, and have to study. Uh, and these uh, online and open universities uh, are offering to these uh, people maybe also for a second opportunities uh, to access uh, good quality courses and also degrees or master degrees, etc. Um, I'm sure all of the online universities we have here in this panel, um, the, the average of the students is uh, adult people, and, and I think we are uh, really lifelong li li learning universities. Uh, and I think it's a uh, very important difference, for instance, with the traditional universities. And the third point, uh, in particular, uh, uh, sorry, something that I, I see in my university and in other universities in the world, is that the open universities usually are, are, are universities who produce uh, knowledge, in, in particular, open knowledge. Uh, that means we, are, we have to build all of uh, learning contents and put these learning contents on a, in a web pages or a, in our virtual campuses. And this is very important because, because we have to produce this with our professors and also with uh, another professor that collaborate with our, our universities. And also it's an opportunity uh, to put these contents open. And, and also, for instance, for uh, countries, uh, we have our, our own language, for instance, in here we have uh, Catalan and also Spanish. It's an also an opportunity to offer to this, uh, sometimes in, in, in case of the Catalan, of course, it's, a minor, it's, a, it's not a huge number of speak, uh, speakers, about 10, million, 10 millions, uh, it's, it's a lot, but it's, it's not like Spanish that is uh, more, 300 millions, but it's also an opportunity to produce uh, knowledge in these languages uh, uh, and also uh, an open uh, open knowledge um, <coughs> we we can distribute uh, for everywhere. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, some very interesting uh, comments there, uh, and I think the last point there, Joseph, that you made about the importance of uh, not only producing but being a champion of open knowledge, open access, um, is something that I certainly, that resonated with me, and I know in your own work personally. Um, I think we've got a few questions that have been going on in the back channel. I invite the panel members maybe just to respond, as I know some of you have, to those specific questions. At this point, I'm just going to go on to our second question, and then we'll take some uh, questions from the chat box. 
But our second question really follows up neatly, I think, on having described the unique features of the open university. I'm using that as a singular, but obviously it covers all sorts of different variations. Um, we're living in changing and uncertain times, so I'm very interested to hear what particular challenges the open universities have faced in those recent times. Um, to start us off, maybe um, Sarah, you might want to pick up that uh, initially, and then other panel members, if you just want to signal with your hand um, physically or with the hand. Okay. Uh, there are many challenges, but again, I will only mention four major ones. First of all, I think that all open universities that were established mainly in the 70s, not like uh, the Universitat Oviedo de Catalonia that was established immediately like an online university, are experiencing what I call an identity crisis. Because for over 150 years, it was very clear and distinct what a campus-based university is and what a distance teaching university is. Right now, the boundaries are totally blurred. And part of it is because the mainstream universities have adopted many flexible features of the open university, which is in a way a victory, but it also uh, challenges what is the specific and unique role now of the open university. And also because of the digital technology uh, kind of revolution, so it, it, it also puts a lot of challenges for the industrial model uh, open uh, university. The second, uh, actually continuing it, is the digi digital technology. It's a little bit par uh, paradox, but the digital technology solves many problems of uh, the, the, the old technology solves. They enable, enable a dialogue between students and themselves and students and their teachers, and they open up all uh, it, the access to a huge resources of libraries, and so it's very easy right now. But on the other hand, because they are built on the model, which is not the model uh, of Universitat Oviedo de Catalonia, but for very nucleus academic stuff, and the academic teaching uh, responsibility is distributed between the senior academic staff, uh, now they were called course coordinators or associate lecturers, and uh, the tutors. So, in a way, this is not the model that is appropriate for the digital uh, time. And in order to move, I think Antonio will say, because I was there in Portugal when you debated how to change the Portuguese Open University and adapt it to the online, so you have uh, your own experience, which is not so easy. And I think also in the UK Open University you did it, but also with a, a, a lot of uh, difficulty. Uh, the other uh, challenge is the change of target population. As I mentioned before, this is when the open universities were started, so very few st studies at universities. Now, if you have 50 to 80 percent in some countries, mainly the developed world, studying at universities, you need to redefine your target populations, which are very, very different. And the, I, I know the teachers were a very important target population in UK open university in Indonesia and also in Israel which is not the case now, because all of them hold already academic degrees. So who are going to be your target population? The weaker part of the society, disadvantaged, even stronger, because we know that at the master degree level, there is huge success and retention at distance education, which is not the case at the first degree. So redefining the target population is a huge challenge that is facing open universities. And, uh, of course, the last one is the growing competition from uh, other universities offering the also online uh, degrees and courses and also all these uh, infrastructures of the MOOC. The last year, I think, they offered already 46 full degrees to uh, the, their infrastructure. In Britain, the case is that the UK Open University is leading the future learn initiative, but it has also 140-something uh, partners. So definitely huge uh, challenges facing the uh, open universities. And in some cases, they even threaten that they are going to be closed because it, they are not relevant anymore to the now the uh, situation. So 
So that's certainly quite a challenge, the point last there about the real identity or future of the Open University. Does anyone uh, on the panel want to pick that up in particular? And Okay, uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Sarah, for also mentioning um, our own experience in Portugal about the transition uh, from the um, well, the industrial model to a, a more uh, online-based model uh, regarding the open universities. Well, picking up on this um, question, I would say that, of course, uh, clearly the open universities have been challenged in, in many ways, but I would m mostly focus on th in three dimensions. First of all, there is the dimension uh, of competition, as, which has already been brought up by Sarah. So the open universities did not just saw all the other traditional uh, universities picking up on their mission um, while, while developing open education uh, resources and practices, developing um, uh, an, imp an uh, impressive uh, provision of MOOCs, for instance, um, sometimes not with the quality standards that should be um, uh, desirable and the ones that actually the open universities have uh, uh, set. Um, also, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, with, of course, this uh, um, move to the digital um, um, arena, also because there is a, an important aspect to the open universities, is in the old um, uh, technological model, uh, technologies were expensive and required uh, important infrastructures that only specific uh, dedicated institutions could have, the open universities. Now, with the move to the online, to the digitalization, uh, it also became much more democratic and all the institutions, all higher education institutions can actually develop their own operations. And this has brought, of course, a challenge to the open universities, which lost a little bit their uniqueness in terms of infrastructure, infrastructure and technology. On the other hand, the, uh, apart from the traditional universities uh, becoming a, a player also in the field, there are a number of new um, uh, digital universities that were uh, set. And uh, apart from it also, new uh, realities, new kinds of uh, non-organizations that have been um, also emerging, uh, associations of students that uh, share resources and share experiences, uh, uh, things like um, Open Educational Resources University or uh, new um, emerging um, uh, ex experiences, even more um, disruptive. Um, on the other hand, if this has been clearly a challenge and that has implied for the Open University to transform, and that transformation has been quite difficult for many, uh, in the case of the Open University of Portugal, this was a dramatic move and we've achieved it in just three years. But this was a really, really complicated, a complex process. It required changing not just um, uh, the, the infrastructure, it required changing the operational model, the pedagogy, uh, retrain all the teacher staff, all the technical staff, uh, to change the organizational culture uh, as well, to retrain students and to um, uh, allow them uh, to um, create a new learning uh, culture as well, well, um, to develop a new learning culture as well. So uh, this was a complex uh, move. And some of the universities, the open universities, have not still completed this move, are still uh, uh, midway between uh, the, the in old industrial model, in a sense, and uh, the, the new uh, online based one. And this has been complicated for most of them because even being designed, having been designed as in, uh, innovative organizations, they are no longer innovative in, in many ways. Uh, another important challenge has been um, uh, um, political because there has been a, there has been a disinvestment of uh, uh, governments in education. So there has been a lack of public resources in higher education, and this has affected, of course, open universities because of their specific social role. And this lack of resources from government, of public funding, has also hindered uh, the de development of the open universities. Uh, apart from these, new forms of uh, assessment and certification uh, that has been uh, driven by MOOCs um, uh, has also not still been completely embraced by the open universities. And this has to be, of course, uh, a thing about it. Uh, there was a, a comment in the chat box, I think it was from Gronje, uh, about the retention. This is a, an important aspect as well. Um, our move from a paper-based model to a, an online-based model was also a move based on the improvement of quality of the learning experience and the um, and reducing uh, retention, uh, uh, so increasing in this sense. 
um, retention, uh, reducing, sorry, <laughs> retention rates. So improving um, um, the learning outcomes and the learning experience, the success of the learning experience. Uh, this is an important aspect that has been also to be taken uh, in consideration by the open universities. Finally, a challenge which has, it's, it's also an important challenge, has been with regulation and quality assurance criteria. Um, in, in Europe and abroad, uh, I mean uh, worldwide, there hasn't been uh, many experiences of specific regulation uh, in distance education. However, uh, in the last couple of years, it has been uh, clear that it, it is important to have this kind of regulations. Why? Because it favors the development of the system in an integrated and organized and regulated way. And also, in, a, in another sense, it, it allows uh, it in, uh, to consolidate quality criteria in, uh, that should be and quality standards that should be met. Regarding quality assurance criteria, this is also uh, an important issue because many of the, especially in terms of formal education, many of the uh, or most of the universities that are operating, especially open universities, have been uh, fighting with the fact that their courses have been accredited using criteria which are designed for face to face education. And this has been a quite an important issue to, um, uh, that has injured uh, in many ways um, the open universities. Fortunately, in the last couple of years, there has been change. There has been a, a great work uh, led by ANQA and also uh, the UA and um, uh, several uh, national quality assurance agencies. And things have changed dramatically. This has been quite an important development. Development, and also in terms of regulation, there are some experiences that could be discussed in the, the next round. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for a very comprehensive answer, Antonio. Um, I know Liz has put a hand up. Uh, Joseph, we'll come to you last, but we'll give you the first opportunity to come in on the next question. So, Liz, I know you wanted to pick up particularly on the funding factor. Thanks, Mark. Um, sorry, is it to jump in front of you, but um, uh, interestingly, I'd, in my notes, I'd written down around the major challenges retention, funding regimes, policy regimes, and competition from other online providers. Um, but I think there's also, I, w I w really wanted to jump in over what Sarah was saying about the identity crisis um, that open universities are facing. And um, I, I think it was John Daniels uh, a couple of years ago who said, at, uh, I heard him say at a conference that open universities are struggling to know how to dress now that other traditional universities have stolen their clothes. And I thought that was a really interesting, uh, an interesting way of, of perceiving it. Um, I, I personally think that there is a role for open universities, and it relates to that inclusion and social justice mission um, that we've all talked about. I think there is still a need for that everywhere um, in the UK, just as much as anywhere else. And um, we're, we're going through an interesting period in that there's, a, there's been a, um, a demographic decline in numbers of young people, but they, are, they will be increasing again. Um, so there was a question about, you know, are, are, are there going to be adults who want our courses? But actually, yes, there is going to be a, more of a, a crisis in the future in terms of um, the numbers of people um, wanting and needing to access higher education. But also, um, because of the funding regimes and because it's become so expensive, the people, the people actually need to work at the same time as they study, otherwise they just can't afford it. So I think there's a, there's a really strong role for open universities there in overcoming some of the challenges, but that universities themselves have challenges. And I think I was really struck, again, with what, what Sarah said um, about, and, and what Antonio said about the need for some kind of transformation. Um, in order to become more agile and more responsive uh, to the things that we need to do. And, and this was really brought home for us last year at the Open University in the UK, and I'm sure you all read about it in the press. Um, it, was, it was no secret that um, that attempt to, tra to transform the institution, um, to, to move it um, to become fully digital, uh, and, and lots of other change, um, was uh, was not handled well, and it wasn't met well by the academic community. And we have actually um, reviewed that um, that attempt at transformation, 
um, and, and started to focus on the things that we know can really make a difference for the student experience. So we've moved back from absolutely transforming um, the, the university um, whole, whole, uh, as a whole um, in one fell swoop uh, to thinking about what are the things that we really need to do to focus on, on student success and student experience. But that brings me into onto also the um, the issue of the of the political and the disinvestment. So as as most people will know, Open University UK used to offer modular study, purely modular study, so people could come and study whatever module they wanted. Um, it was affordable. Um, and we didn't have to charge too high, too high fees because of the money that we got directly from government. In 2012 in England, that changed completely so that we were forced to increase our fees and students could only get loans for, um, for um, full qualifications and only if they were studying at the minimum of 25% study intensity. So, so we were we were forced to change what we had to do in order to fit in that in that kind of um, ideological environment that says that all higher education should be delivered as full qualifications, um, and that's how universities should be assessed. And we've always really really struggled uh, in the UK to meet the funding body requirements um, because they're structured around what. A traditional university does. It's 18-year-old students studying full-time um, in, in face-to-face, -face. Uh, and, and every every policy, every measure, everything that's put in place to assess us is focused on that model. So that's a real, real challenge for us. Um, and and I think the biggest challenge lies in retention. And I think we've all talked about that. I, I did a little bit of work with a colleague. Um, a year ago to look at retention in open universities. It's actually very, very difficult to, co to make comparisons because all the funding regimes are different and people operate in different ways. But I think that, that, that we all have a challenge around retention. And when we start to be measured against uh, the traditional sector in terms of you know, success means you must acquire a full degree, then we really struggle because many of our students are not doing it for that reason. They're doing it for, for other reasons. It could be that they just want a bit of learning at a particular time. So changing the narrative around success is something that we really need to address if we're going to, if we're going to make some, um, uh, some impact there, particularly on policy. And if I had a, a euro, I'll, get, I'll say, um, rather than a pound, for every time I've reminded government ministers and government officials of um, the need to remember adults and part-time learners. I could probably retire by now, but unfortunately it hasn't yet made any, made any difference. But I think those are just some of the things that I could, I could go on for hours, but I'm not going to. I'm going to let Joseph um, get in his, his Hi, just a few comments. Um, I think from my point of view, the challenge uh, during these last past uh, 10 years from the open universities, as some of you said before, uh, from my point of view is to preserve our identity. Uh, that means uh, to be clear that what is a, a real open or uh, online uh, university. And in that sense, to me, it's important to two points. No? The first one is the quality. I think quality uh, has been one of the most important challenges during this uh, period, last uh, 10 years. Um, and quality is it's not only retention, or uh, of course, it's, that is a very important point, because we have also to define what means retention in online or in open universities, because sometimes there is people that is uh, looking for uh, maybe some knowledge, but not for the final degree. But uh, we need to preserve and improve uh, quality, for instance, in teaching the learning process or quality of the, our learning materials, etc. Uh, and the most important thing uh, to do that, of course, uh, one of the important things is uh, to uh, preserve also our reputation as, uh, as a universities. In particular, in some areas of in the world where the online or distance universities are considered as, as not uh, good universities. And I think this is a big challenge for us uh, to preserve and to maintain everything related to the technology, uh, so to the quality process. And the second thing 
during the last uh, 10 years, of course, is the period when uh, many of face-to-face -face -to -face or traditional universities introduced the technology uh, in the teaching and learning process. Not, uh, this is the period of the MOOCs, uh, blended learning, hybrid learning, with, uh, classrooms, etc. Uh, it, it's again, uh, it, that is very important for us in order to maintain our identity as an online university. That means uh, online courses is not that this, an online university is not a university that offers MOOCs or hybrid uh, uh, programs. It's another kind of university which has uh, their own methodology, their particular uh, focus on this methodology, and of course can offer uh, MOOCs and other kind of um, uh, these uh, short courses, etc. But this is not only the focus, or is not the same uh, MOOCs than online universities. No? But uh, this challenge is also an opportunity uh, to collaborate with face-to-face uh, -face, uh, universities or traditional universities. And I think that these things happen, uh, for instance, here in, in Catalonia and many other countries in Latin America and countries that I know very well, um, this uh, situation uh, the improving the uses of technology for uh, the teaching and learning processes in the face-to-face -face universities uh, allow a lot of opportunities to collaborate uh, with online universities uh, around the world. And I think this is also positive. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, some very interesting perspectives there on the challenges. Uh, I think all I can say is that there are uh, a multitude of uh, fronts that your that open universities are battling in many respects, um, from identity to the issue of funding to the quality perception um, and so forth. So I suppose we might um, just take a moment to. Uh, reflect on um, any other follow-up comments or any comments that have come through the chat box. Are there any of the panel members that want to just come back with an additional comment or rejoin up? Teach a wait moment here, but in the absence of anything, let's move on then. I've got one eye on the time as well to our third question, which in many respects um, we've already touched on. But I think here I want to take that whole sense of identity and perhaps even to the point of crisis uh, where I think one of the, uh, it was Liz, you talked about um, using the metaphor of clothing and the fact that uh, Tanio, at least you if not others, talked about new competition here. Um, so to what extent really is the Open University, given we've already explained how it is unique, um, unique by its mission in particular, Therefore, in today's digital era, is it still relevant? Um, I'm going to hand over uh, initially to uh, Liz, and then to Joseph, and then to Sarah. Hey, thank you. Sorry, I was expecting to go last, Mark, and then <laughs> it took me by surprise. Um, OK. Um, so the question, to what extent is the Open University still relevant in the digital era? Um, I think it's as relevant as ever, but, um, and I think I'd, I was trying to make this point earlier, that, that being digital in and of itself isn't the crucial factor. So um, we, we have a, a, you know, there's loads of fantastic stuff going on in digital worlds. There's some brilliant stuff being done online. We've got some, um, some really superb um, initiatives, um, things like um, you know online laboratories and um, um, digital microscopes and um, all kinds of exciting things. And one of the things that I've been um, been working on is, uh, is a, some of you may have heard of it, as a student hub live, where we've been um, webcasting live webcasting to students to help them feel like part of a, a community. Um, a community of learners um, using technologies in new ways to engage students and of course there's loads of stuff around um, around AI and what could be done there um, but I think for me digital is just another way of dealing with distance I, I can't remember who it was said this but I heard somebody talk about um, 
uh, you know, technology enabled learning is a bit like saying a, a, a fork is technology enabled eating, which is <laughs> quite an interesting way of thinking about it. But um, it, digital technologies don't, in and of themselves, resolve the issues of social justice. They don't, in and of themselves, transform lives. They don't give access to those previously excluded, but they can help. So I did put in the chat um, a little earlier that we have a we we have around 1,700 students who are in prison. Um, I was fortunate enough to go and um, and and award degrees to three of those prisoners uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a really genuinely moving experience for me, and it made me appreciate what we do and why we do it. But the technology isn't actually very useful in that space. Uh, because that, that one of the students was telling me that they'd had a, a lockdown due to a security breach, and because they couldn't find out which particular student had breached the security, they closed access for all of the students. So, so, so technology can help us, and digital is really useful. Um, but as I say, it doesn't in and of itself necessarily make the difference that we need it to make. Having said that, we, there are some amazing things which are being done with technology um, and, uh, in the digital era, and I think open universities are leading the way in that. Um, so uh, so I'm, I, I think there's clearly a, a, a space. We are leading the way. We've done a huge, um, somebody mentioned that we, we own FutureLearn, and we're looking for, at the moment at how we put our postgrad onto um, FutureLearn. Lots of things that we're still doing, but when it comes down to it, um, resolving issues of social justice and transforming lives are actually what um, you need policy to to do, as well as as well of course the the models that we're using. Um, so it's 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 very multifaceted, and I don't think technology on its own is the thing that makes the difference. But I shall give way to I think. Who's next, Mark? I'm the. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, regarding to the, your question about the the open university, which is still relevant in this digital era, um, I have three three points to comment. No, that in my in my notes, the first one is okay in, in this. Uh, it, New digital era and nowadays, uh, I think um, not only the open universities or the online universities are changing. Also, the traditional ones of face-to-face -face universities are changing. A new kind of universities are um, appearing this moment in a different countries, uh, doing uh, different things. That means we we have to analyze. Uh, uh, these movements that were happening now uh, with um, the, in, in the area uh, of uh, uh, universities or higher education and, and, and try to find uh, our role there, our position there, our definition as, a, as an open university. Uh, to, to me, that is very important because the many of the new emerging uh, university models nowadays in these moments, of course, all of them are, are using uh, technology and many of them are, are introducing or uh, accepting as a usual for them uh, online uh, uh, methodologies. Uh, that means it's very important for the European University to uh, define uh, clearly which is a position and the technological and methodological uh, role um, in order to collaborate or to compete or to work or to offer uh, courses in this uh, in this open world um, in digital era. Uh, the second point is uh, regarding to the one of the first that I mentioned is about, about lifelong learning. I think, uh, of course, uh, the open universities, uh, this is our focus, uh, our students, but uh, we need to think about that because uh, usually when we talk about uh, lifelong learning, we are talking about uh, adult people, but for instance, in my university and, and another open universities, we are receiving now also young uh, students, the students that work in, uh, studying, for instance, in another face-to-face uh, -face universities, but it's uh, doing something for us. And, and to me, uh, we need to think about the, possibil the possibility to flexibilize more the curricula of our uh, courses and our degrees. I think that is very important in this uh, new digital era 
it's not on, only think about uh, traditional masters and degrees, etc., or traditional courses. I think we need to offer thinking in this uh, new lifelong learning approach um, a more uh, flexibility uh, to follow um, a particular curriculum in order to offer the students uh, or the participants uh, the knowledge that they want to have or that they want to achieve. And the last point that I have here in my notes, I think we, in this digital era, uh, we have to continue leading and promoting, of course, everything related to open. Uh, I think this is uh, something that we did and we continue uh, doing uh, nowadays, and I think it's very important to preserve that, and as I mentioned at the, the beginning, also producing uh, knowledge, sharing this knowledge, uh, putting this knowledge open, uh, and also it's something that is very clear with my previous point about the, the, the flexible curricula. Okay, this is the three things uh, uh, that I want to share with you. In Now okay, okay. Uh, so I will repeat. I think this open university model is very relevant in the digital era uh, because mainly of the scale of the operation of most distance teaching universities, which are the largest universities in their national jurisdictions, and also because of their flexibility. But obviously, they have to do some things in order to be more relevant. First of all, to define a clear mission. Uh, which is a little bit blurred, and some universities they kind of are refrained from doing it. Define uh, who are the target populations, do they want to focus mainly on bachelor degree or advanced degree, on micro uh, credentials, uh, do they want to be more international in their scope of operation, with whom do they want to collaborate, with whom they are competing. So it's a huge frame that they have to decide, and many universities refrain from doing it business teaching universities currently. The second point, which is very important, is to keep their reputation. Because business education for many years, and also currently even in some places, has a bad reputation. It's a lower level, higher education. Uh, the UK Open University, I think, was the only one that for several years appeared in the Shanghai ranking table as one of the 500 leading research universities. Very important to strengthen the status of open universities in order to keep uh, their reputation strong in their countries and also worldwide, and it's not an easy thing uh, to do. MOOCs and OER, yesterday I listened to the webinar, many uh, many talked about the MOOCs and webinar uh, and the OER. Uh, we do not know yet how to uh, use it efficiently and effectively in the learning systems of open universities and also other universities, so it's very important. And now I saw that the, that the trend is to offer a full degree, which is going to increase, I think, in uh, the future. And of course, collaboration. This is a very important thing. If at the beginning for most open universities, it was very important when I wrote the book to say that they are stand-alone universities. They are autonomous, they do not need anyone, they are stand-alone universities. Now collaboration is the name of the game. We have to collaborate with other higher education institutions and also with the corporate and with the work uh, places. So it's very important to frame the collaboration for a kind of uh, the, the future collaborative ventures that each university wants uh, to enhance. And uh, the last point that I want to, to um, emphasize, I published a few months ago an article which is called e-teaching is a prerequisite for e-learning. It is too much taken for granted that we live in the digital era and we know exactly how to study and how to teach through this media. Most students, even those that were born with the, the computers in their hands and laptops and all these things, do not know how to study through the digital uh, uh, devices. And teachers as well, they cannot use it effectively if they will not get very strong support mechanisms for doing so. So it's very important for open universities uh, to uh, provide support systems for both students and teachers in order to use most efficiently and effectively the digital technology. And here I will stop.
So Antonio, that just leaves you to wrap up. Um, just relatively briefly, just mindful of the time. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. So um, building up from what has already been said, um, I would say that, of course, uh, if we, uh, if the, uh, the success story of our trans transition from the industrial model to the online-based model was collaboration, uh, as Sarah has pointed out, collaboration has also to be the key word in the future, not just among the open universities themselves, but with the other higher education institutions as well. However, um, we have to look at it from a, a different perspective. In fact, if we look at, uh, if we, we, we would ask w what would be the, uh, the relevancy, or, or I mean, the, the importance of open education or distance uh, le uh, learning in the sense of online learning or technology enhanced learning or whatever, uh, we would, would say in the, in the near future, this would be, of course, critical. Um, it would be dominant. So, uh, as the open universities uh, face this new era in which uh, digital education will be mainstream, what are their role? What are they needed for? And this is something that um, is uh, also this is also worrying um, politicians and uh, the society in general. So we have to face the mistrust from um, governments who would say, okay, why should we pay the open universities if the others are already doing the same? So we have to be different. And secondly, um, from the um, from society as well, if you look at the, ne the, the, the new gen the next generations in a sense, there is a clear mistrust for institutions. So they are really keen in, um, in learning uh, online and in, in using digital learning in, in its broader sense, in an informal sense as well, but they are these mistrusting institutions. So what is the place of an institution who, be, uh, although doing the same as the others, uh, claims to be uh, specific? Well, in this sense, maybe there is a, a clue from what is happening in Portugal at this stage. There is a new legislation that is going to be implemented which uh, basically regulates um, the distance education in Portugal. And the idea, the main idea is the following. There is a holistic approach to the system. The Open University will play a different role from the others. And so basically, uh, the Open University and all the others who want to be funded by the government in order to deliver open uh, distance education will have to work in association. So there's not just one or the other, all have to c collaborate uh, of course, in different kinds of consortia, all that have to collaborate in order to be funded by the government. What is the role of the Open University? Basically, to, um, uh, of course, to establish itself as a clear international reference in terms of research and development and innovation, and establish the standard for the entire system, the quality standard for the entire system, as well, also to share its knowledge and expertise with the others, and collaborate with the others in order for them all to uh, upscale and for the system as a whole to, uh, of course, enhance its uh, its capability and also to increase its out its outreach. So the system can w um, um, uh, grow as long as the, the 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 different universities collaborate and the open university has a central uh, uh, position, a central role in that by, of course, um, um, acquiring the know-how and uh, sharing the know-how with the others and also the resources. In this sense, there's a kind of uh, unbundling uh, of, of, uh, um, of the structure of the Open University as well. And we would, of course, increase the expertise in some aspects and share the other with the others um, elements which we don't have as uh, of so much quality. This kind of unbundled model of organization of the open universities is innovative in its sense. And this is also a contribution that the open university is uh, giving to the system, which is leading innovation also in terms of um, the, um, the university structure and management as well, apart from, uh, of course, the, uh, educational, the education practice. So this kind of thing uh, could be uh, an indication of what lies in the future for the open universities. But we have to be also careful 
uh, in one point. We're discussing the reality of the European open universities. This is not exactly the same as the reality of the uh, open universities in Asia or in uh, South America or in Africa. These are also different because they are responding to different uh, uh, regional contexts, cultural contexts, social contexts, political contexts. And so this is something that we, this conclusion maybe be uh, uh, relevant at this stage for the European context and maybe a, a reference for the future to the other regions as well. But uh, this is something that we have to be careful when uh, making the generalization as well. But this could be a, a, a clue of what lies ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, I think that very last point's a, a, a great way for us just to kind of bring things to a close with an eye on the time. Um, and if I could just draw on the danger of uh, generalizing about the open university, because in parts of the developing world in particular, they are much more in transition from a traditional pack and post model, as it's sometimes described. But if I was to pull out three points that just I'm taking away from this conversation, and apologies, we haven't uh, drawn too many questions um, that we've put to the panel members from our participants, although they've been a reasonably good back channel conversation. The three things that I um, am taking away is just how important that mission or vision is, what it is that is unique to take our first question, um, that really defines the open university. Obviously, different universities will have slightly different missions, but by nature, the open university has a different kind of mission. And um, Joseph, I think you were the person in particular, but it really ran through all of the um, panel members' feedback around the importance of then the focus on lifelong learning or adult learning, as you talked about, part-time. But this sense of taking a much more holistic view of the learning experience. And of course, the unique nature of the learners themselves and where they come from as distinct from perhaps school leavers and campus-based education, although that in itself is a dangerous generalization. And then perhaps most importantly that I'm just taking from this conversation is that important role that social justice has. Um, and Liz, you made a great point that we can't, I, I remember a book from one of my mentors many, many years ago who said that education can't make jobs. Um, well, education can't fix society, it's part of the fix, but we can't expect it to really solve overnight and on its own the deep structural inequities that we have within not just our societies, but humanity at large. Um, so clearly open universities play an important role, but they have to be connected, and that's probably a, a fourth point to policy, to politicians, to practice, obviously, as well. But um, on that note, I think what I'd like to do is just kind of thank you formally for your contribution. I know we've had a, um, a steady a number of participants between 30 and 40 during the whole session. That's always a good indication that people have stayed with us. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation, as I hope you have. And I just need to do one final thing. If you really want to continue these discussions with um, particularly these panel members, but also many of you who are in the um, community here in this chat room, um, then we invite you to attend this year's Eden Conference in Bruges in uh, June, in the middle of June. Um, we'll certainly be picking up on some of these themes, and it's really one of Europe, Europe's um, major conferences in this particular field. So on that little advertorial note, um, I think I'll formally uh, now hand off and sign off on today's webinar as part of Open Education Week. Thank you. And of Goodbye. course, hopefully we'll see some of you at tomorrow's event as well. So thank you. Thank you.